Welcome back. I'm excited to share with you some work that I've done with Steve Brunton and Nathan Coots here at the University of Washington. We've titled this project Deep Learning of Conjugate Mappings, and there's a paper of exactly the same name that can currently be found on the archive that summarizes all of the results that you're going to see here today. And at this GitHub repository, you can find the code that's associated to the paper to reproduce all of the findings and the figures. Now, in some of my recent videos, I've emphasized how we can use Poincaré sections and their associated Poincaré mappings in order to understand the dynamics and the topology of a chaotic attractor embedded in the flow of a continuous time dynamical system. Now, the disadvantage that comes with using these Poincaré mappings is that if I give you an explicit continuous time dynamical system, it is nearly impossible to find an explicit representation of the discrete time associated Poincaré mapping. And this is something that has really uh, preoccupied a lot of my research recently, where I've been taking a data-driven perspective to find accurate and parsimonious descriptions of these Poincaré mappings. In particular, I've been using the CINDY method, the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics, which roughly will expand out the function f in a basis or a library of candidate functions, allowing you to tune the coefficients in that basis appropriately to best fit your data. Now, the disadvantage that this method comes with is that your mapping is only as accurate as your library of candidate functions allows you to be. And therefore, what I'm going to propose today is a method that will allow you to change the variables in such a way that you can get away with using a very, very simple and small library of candidate functions. And the theoretical background that all of this is going to lie upon is that of topological conjugacies. Now, this is an old idea from dynamical systems theory, which allows you to re relate two iteration schemes, say f and another function g, which might be posed on completely different spaces. And the way this works is that you seek to find a homeomorphism, h, which will conjugate you from the x space to the y space. And what this commutative diagram beside me really says is that if you would like to iterate yourself from x space back into x space using the mapping f, what you could do instead is change the variables down to y space with the homeomorphism, iterate forward in y space using the mapping g, and then come back to x space by applying the inverse of that homeomorphism. And the advantage here is that this allows one to relate relatively complicated systems to potentially much simpler systems. So allow me to illustrate this with one of the most well-known examples of topological conjugacies. And that's the conjugacy between the so-called tent mapping, that's the mapping F down here, and the logistic mapping, that's the mapping G down here. And Although these are simple one-dimensional mappings, I emphasize that from a model discovery standpoint, one of these mappings is much more difficult to find than the other. And that is the tent mapping, because it is a piecewise linear function. And so that would require you to have a basis which includes piecewise linear functions as well, which seems to be highly unlikely. Whereas, if we could find a way of conjugating the variables into this y space, we can see that the iterative scheme is now a simple quadratic polynomial given by this logistic type function down here, which is certainly amenable to typical model discovery algorithms as most people include monomials up to a finite degree in their library of candidate functions. So, it seems that if we would like to apply this method to Poincaré section data, the hard part is going to be finding the change of variable. And this is where neural networks come in. We are proposing a neural network architecture, which is based on that of an autoencoder, for which the encoder function takes the form 
of this homeomorphism that changes the variables from x into a latent space. The decoder is the inverse of this homeomorphism that takes you from the latent space back out. And on the inside of the network here is your latent mapping, your conjugate mapping G, which you expand in a basis which could be kept relatively simple, say monomials, for example. And during the training process, you find the weights that give you the appropriate h and h inverse, as well as the coefficients in this basis expansion for your mapping g. And if you're looking at this whole neural network as just a function, it's mimicking exactly that conjugacy diagram that you saw on the previous slide. That is, the input here is a single element from the Poincaré section. What happens is it's conjugated and the variable is changed using the encoder function. It's iterated forward using the discovered mapping G, the conjugate map. And then it is transformed back to the Poincaré section using the inverse of that homeomorphism, the decoder function. So this neural network is just one application of the Poincaré mapping. Now this offers a number of advantages. First and foremost among them is that this allows us to represent potentially very, very complicated dynamics in the Poincaré section to something that could be relatively simple as defined by the library that you use to expand your latent mapping G in. Second of all, autoencoders are typically employed for dimensionality reduction. We can do the same thing here. You can imagine that you have a very high dimensional Poincaré section data, but it's really just describing something that is very, very low dimensional. Then what this can do is this can project you onto that low dimensional manifold and find the mapping that will iterate you along that manifold given by the latent space Y. Another advantage here is that we see improved forecasting of the chaotic dynamical system in the Poincaré mapping. And this just comes from the fact that you are better fitting your data. You're finding the right basis to expand your function g in once you've conjugated those variables. And finally, the most important aspect here is that topological conjugacy preserves the topology of a chaotic attractor. So that tells us that if you want to understand what's happening in the Poincaré section, then you really just need to understand what's happening in your potentially simpler latent mapping G. Now, let me come back to something that I mentioned about dimensionality reduction. One thing that we can do is we can precisely quanti quantify what dimension we should actually be seeking on the inside of that network for the latent space Y. And this comes from using Lyapunov exponents. And Lyapunov exponents are a way of quantifying the separation along the chaotic attractor, that sensitive dependence to initial conditions that defines chaos. And in particular, what we can do is we can order these real valued Lyapunov exponents from ascending to descending. And typically, the presence of chaos is marked by a, at least one positive Lyapunov exponent, which you can see from this representation right here tells us that orbits are being pushed away exponentially in time. And therefore, we can estimate the dimension of the chaotic attractor in the continuous time dynamical system using the Kaplan-York dimension. So this is coming from the Kaplan-York conjecture that says that this dimension is the Hausdorff dimension of that chaotic attractor. And since we are moving to a chaotic, or to a Poincaré section, we will take one dimension off of this Kaplan-York dimension, and that will be our dimension of the latent space inside of the network. Let me illustrate this with my favorite chaotic dynamical system, and that is the Rosler system. This is a three-dimensional chaotic system in three variables, x, y, and z. The precise representation of the system is given on the board here, and here you can see the flow in the three-dimensional phase space. Now, 
For our Poincaré section, we're going to take the x equal to 0 plane. And the reason we'll take that is because the Rosler system has a very nice property that when x is equal to 0, necessarily z must be 0 as well. So that means that we're really just tracking the single y values each time we go around this attractor. And what you're seeing down here is the resulting Poincaré mapping. The current iterate on the horizontal axis versus the next iterate on the vertical axis. And what we can see from that picture, without looking too closely, is that it looks like a quadratic mapping. But when we look slightly closer at it, we can see that it's not quite a quadratic mapping because the sides of it are just a little too straight. Indeed, if you try to fit a quadratic polynomial to this, you will see that it's not going to work. It will not be an accurate representation of this Poincaré section. And so just for comparison, we can fit that quadratic polynomial using the Cindy method. And what the result here is given by this mapping here at the top of the board. Now, what I've done is I've conjugated the variables so that it's easy to compare between the Cindy model and the conjugacy model. And what you can see from the conjugacy model is that this is the result of applying our neural network to discover the latent space mapping G. They are both in the same form. The only thing that differs between the two of them is the leading coefficient in their logistic type functions. And so the question is, which one is better? Well, the first thing that we can do is we can turn to some old results about these, these quadratic functions, these logistic functions. And what we know is that as you increase that leading parameter, here denoted by r, that logistic function undergoes a sequence of period doubling bifurcations, eventually resulting in chaos. Now, if you look at where each of these respective models is along these, the, uh, this bifurcation diagram, what you can see is that the Cindy model puts you in a region where the chaotic attractor is two disjoint regions, and the chaos hasn't fully developed yet. Whereas the conjugacy model is putting us far to the end of this period doubling cascade, cementing us well into the chaotic regime. So again, which one is better? Well, we can compare these two models by doing some forecasting. And so what you're seeing here is the result of forecasting both the actual Rosler system just by simulating the ODE, that's the yellow squares, the Cindy method given by the white dots and lines, and the conjugacy model given by the teal dots and lines. And you can see that the Cindy model is very inaccurate as it falls off after about one iteration in this discovered mapping. Whereas the conjugacy model remains accurate for seven or even eight iterations of this Poincaré section. Now we emphasize that this is almost as good as you're going to be able to get because the system is chaotic and therefore it's extremely sensitive to both initial conditions and the parameters that are being tuned here. But this is a significant improvement over the Cindy model. OK, let us turn to a slightly more realistic and more interesting example. And that is the kuramoto shivashinsky partial differential equation. This is a fourth order in space, first order in time differential equation. You can see a candidate representative of the uh, space-time flow, where space is on the horizontal axis, Time is on the vertical axis. This is a contour plot of the flow. And you can see that there is a single parameter here, this hyper diff uh, diffusion parameter given by nu. And the traditional method by which that we, uh, we analyze this system is using a Fourier or a Galerkin projection. That is, we are going to expand the PDE solution, u of x and t, in terms of the odd Fourier modes, sine of kt, and write down a large coupled nonlinear dynamical system for those Fourier coefficients, a, k of t. And this has been investigated by a number of authors, 
In a recent paper from 2015, it was shown that in this system, as you decrease the value of nu, your system undergoes a period doubling cascade, eventually culminating in chaos. Just like what we saw on the previous slide with the logistic system. And what you can do is you can see that in this region of new values where you're experiencing this period doubling cascade, the Kaplan-York dimension is approximately two, telling you that the chaotic attractor is really just two-dimensional, even if you're using a number of modes to describe this projection. That means that your Poincaré section data should be described by a one-dimensional attractor. And what we're able to do with this method is we're able to use 14 Fourier modes, and we're able to find a conjugacy between that 13-dimensional Poincaré data and a simple logistic mapping, a one-dimensional mapping that describes 13-dimensional data. An example of one of our results comes from this value of nu near the end of the period doubling cascade, for which we find it is conjugate to just a simple logistic mapping where the leading coefficient is 3.96, which is very, very close to the culmination of that period doubling cascade. And now one of the things that you can really do with this is now you can understand the topology of that chaotic attractor. For example, you can pull out the location of the unstable periodic orbits in the Kuramoto flow that uh, using just this simple logistic mapping. That is, all you need to do is mine out the recurrent points from that conjugate logistic mapping, map them back to the full 13-dimensional Poincaré section. You can use that data to initialize a shooting method that provides you with accurate initial guesses to find those unstable periodic orbits that are embedded within this chaotic flow. And so some candidate examples are given right here. In the background right here, is in white, is the full chaotic attractor. And superimposed in blue on top of that is the shortest period, unstable periodic orbit that makes up the, the skeleton of this chaotic attractor. And then the remaining uh, unstable periodic orbits are a sample of the low period orbits that can be extracted using this method. I want to emphasize that in the paper we go through many more examples and we apply these methods to a variety of different nonlinear dynamical systems. So we go far beyond just the Rosler and the Kuramoto system, the Kuramoto Shibashinsky systems. We also apply this to the Lorenz system and to the Mackey Glass delay differential equation. This tells us that our methods can be used to analyze both low dimensional and high dimensional ordinary differential equations as well as infinite dimensional delay differential equations. Now, moving forward, there is a lot more that we would like to do with this method. In particular, the kuramoto shibashinsky equation is the prototypical model for studying and understanding turbulence. It's one of the simplest systems that gives it to us and is still one of the most difficult to analyze. And in particular, as you continue to de decrease that hyperdiffusion parameter, nu, you see that the chaos becomes much more full, uh, fuller developed and much more complex, as measured by the Kaplan-York dimension. And so therefore, we would like to continue to push that parameter nu down to better understand the high dimensional attractors that are emerging using this conjugacy method. And as an example of some of our work that we've been able to do here, you can see right here is the chaotic attractor superimposed against the 10th Fourier mode against the first Fourier mode for a much smaller value of nu than what I showed you on the previous slide. And again, you can see superimposed over top of that chaotic attractor is one of the unstable periodic orbits, which we've been referring to as the bat, as you can see from the image here. And since I mentioned turbulence, of course, the place that we want to be able to take this is to understand turbulent fluid dynamics. We hope to report on this in the near future, and I thank you very much for watching.